Thank you, Jody, for that kind introduction. And um, thank you so much to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong. I'm really honored to speak here. Um, I used to be a member when I lived in, here in Hong Kong, and I just loved it. And it's great to see so many familiar faces from my time here in Hong Kong. It's really wonderful to be back again. Actually, I only left less than two years ago, but it's really, I, I, it's still um, wonderful to be visiting again. So I don't want to speak too long. I have this PowerPoint presentation that usually takes me about an hour to get through, but um, I, I want to get to Q&A relatively quickly. So um, I thought I would start by just uh, introducing the, the Feminist Five. Um, in, 2005, in 2015, the Chinese authorities uh, arrested a large number of feminist activists in multiple Chinese cities. And these feminist activists were planning to celebrate International Women's Day by handing out anti-sexual harassment stickers on subways and buses. But before they were even able to to carry out that activity, the Chinese police conducted a really sweeping round of arrests in multiple cities, arrested at least 10 feminist activists, detained them, interrogated them, and then focused on five young women, brought the women um, all to Beijing and held them in a detention center. And it looked as though these women were going to be criminally prosecuted for some form of disturbance the social order. Um, but what the Chinese authorities didn't anticipate was um, that in trying to wipe out the possibility of a large-scale feminist uh, movement from developing, they, they actually sparked the growth of a really significant political movement that has only gained momentum in the years since. And it's been fascinating for me to watch that. I've been interviewing, uh, I've been interviewing these young women ever since um, they were released after 37 days, um, but then they were under de facto house arrest, so you couldn't really get to them for several months. But then as soon as the police loosened their grip on these women, I started to interview them um, beginning in November of 2015. So uh, what I'd like to do is start out by reading something very, very brief, just a tiny little excerpt from my book. The book is titled uh, Betraying Big Brother. And that actually comes from one of the Feminist Five's personal account of uh, when she was arrested and how she was treated. Um, so the, the particular activist I'm writing about, uh, she she had to wear glasses and without her glasses she was basically blind. She couldn't see anything. And in fact uh, with all of the women, four of the five of the feminist five wore glasses. And the first thing that security agents did when they arrested these women was to confiscate their glasses. And, um, and then they held the women in uh, unheated rooms in a, a, a police station, took their snow boots, took their coats, so it was freezing in the middle of winter at night, so below freezing. And so this one activist um, in particular, I'm not going to name her actually, you can, you can read all about it in the book, um, but she described feeling completely powerless and terrified because she was freezing cold. She didn't know what was going on. She couldn't see anything, but she could hear. And so she describes uh, just not being able to see and that she heard the voices around her of some of the feminists that she knew. And she put her ear up against the cell of the isolation ward. And then she was able to make out the voices of some of her feminist uh, sisters or uh, fellow activists. And um, I'm going to skip forward to her beginning to regain a sense of hope again. Wei 
later described how she overcame her feeling of helplessness in an online essay she called Prison Notes, which she posted on WeChat under a pseudonym. I decided I must resist this feeling of sorrow and take action, so I started to do a lot of different things. My room was freezing and I was only allowed to wear slippers, so I began doing leg exercises such as kicks and squats. Then I did deep meditation exercises. Other people before me had scratched words onto the old walls, so I squinted my eyes up close to the walls to examine them. Then I spun around in circles, singing songs she wrote. Wei sang out loud, both to cheer herself up and to let the other detained women hear her voice and know that they were not alone, that she too was in there with them. Li Maizi also sang back, a song for all women, the anthem of China's feminist movement. Protect my rights, don't keep me down, why must I lose my freedom? Let's break free from our heavy shackles and reclaim our power as women. Her spirits buoyed, Wei Tingting writes, she recovered her sense of defiance. Even as I heard two guards walking back and forth, making clanking noises outside, I felt a kind of joy in betraying Big Brother. So that's where the title of the book comes from. Now, um, what the authorities uh, did not foresee was that in jailing these five young women, they would actually galvanize uh, the, the few members of the feminist community in China. At that time, there really weren't that many. There were around 100 young fem feminist activists um, who carried out these, uh, here's a picture of the Feminist Five, um, but they were carrying out acts of what they called performance art, um, focusing on various issues related to women's rights, one of them Bloody Brides, uh, where these three women wore faux blood-stained wedding dresses to draw attention to the epidemic of domestic violence in China. Um, below there was a, a performance art uh, called Occupy Men's Toilets in Guangzhou in 2012 where they took over the men's public bathroom and uh, they said women come and use these toilets to draw attention to the the lack of toilets for women, that there, there are always so many more toilets for men. So they deliberately chose these issues that they thought were not controversial. These are, these are things that the Chinese government publicly supports. Publicly, the government uh, upholds gender equality. Gender equality is, is written into the Constitution of the People's Republic. Um, and so they thought, you know, these, are, these topics are not at all politically controversial or sensitive in any way. And in fact, with the Occupy Men's Toilets action, the Chinese state media, including the People's Daily, wrote about it in rather glowing terms. Um, so this went on for several years, and they, they carried out these isolated acts. Um, so it was such a shock in 2015, it just came out of nowhere, that these five young women were suddenly jailed and looked like they were on course to being sent to a prison uh, for at least five years. Well, um, the global outcry to the jailing of these women was really incredible. Um, and. Uh, Part of it was was the timing of the jailing of the women, because President Xi Jinping was about to co-host a World Women's Conference at the United Nations in New York, and so the blatant hypocrisy of the Chinese president hosting a conference supposedly, you know, promoting women's rights globally while at home jailing young women just for commemorating International Women's Day that hypocrisy um, was on display for the entire world. And at the time, Hillary Clinton was considered to be front runner for the US presidency. She tweeted her outrage and uh, said this was shameless, that, that um, Xi Jinping was persecuting feminists while hosting a meeting on women's rights at the UN. 
Um, the other photographs that I show are part of a solidarity campaign that was organized by other feminist activists inside China, um, and they posted each day, marking each day of detention of the five women. There would be other uh, five young women who wore masks of the feminist five, and would so that first pose on the right is. Um, kind of modeled off the Beatles Abbey Road um, and, and it would say uh, the first day of detention um, and each day they would post a new pose of five women wearing the masks of the feminist five posing in public um, enjoying freedom of movement free from harassment as though they were not in detention. Um, and then amazingly, after 37 days, the government took the rather unprecedented move of releasing these women. Um, and it had attracted a, an enormous amount of international news coverage. And I, I strongly believe that that global diplomatic pressure, um, and there were also a lot of global protests in support of these women, I, I strongly believe that that public pressure contributed to the government's decision to release these young women. So I'm going to skip over uh, some of this is, I, I write a lot about how, um, I'm going to skip to a picture here, I write about how uh, a lot of people who think about uh, what it is, what's the nature of authoritarianism in China, I, you know, they come up with different uh, ways to explain why it is that the Communist Party has endured for so many years. It's now outlasted the Soviet Communist Party um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I argue that actually this is a patriarchal authoritarianism, that the subjugation of women is absolutely key to a communist rule and exerting control over the entire population, particularly in the last few decades with the advent of market reforms, that the government sees women primarily as reproductive tools, and so they need to be um, confined to the home, to be baby breeders, um, to take care of babies, raise children, take care of the elderly, um, and, and tame the violent urges of men. Um, so, for example, there's one widespread violence against women, there is sexual violence, there's a lot of domestic violence. Um, and even though China passed an anti-domestic violence law in, uh, or enacted the law two years ago, in 2016, um, this was seen as a legal milestone, but two and a half years later we see the law is just not being enforced in any way. And, and, and I believe that it never will be enforced under Communist Party rule because uh, violence against women is part of what the male-dominated Communist Party believes is critical to ensuring its political legitimacy. It just, uh, it's all part of the proper role of women versus men. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So these are just a couple of images from Chinese state television presenting Xi Jinping as um, this strong man ruler the, or the, the paternalistic patriarch who rules over the nation. Um, and the nation here, the, some of the language that um, I noticed in Xinhua News last year is very interesting. The, the importance of family values. So this, this is a quote from Xinhua last year. C stresses the importance of family values. He says, little family, xiao jia, but he has in mind the big family, guo jia. And guo jia means uh, nation state in Chinese, but there's the character jia, which means family. And so this Xinhua article um, shows how the harmony of each individual male-dominated family in China where everybody plays their proper role, uh, where the wife is, is dutiful and obeys the husband and the children obey the parents, as long as each 
little family is harmonious and of course the uh, it's they're headed by a married man and woman um, and same-sex marriage is illegal in China but that it's this accretion of many many male dominated families that contributes to the political stability of the so-called large family the Guoxia nation-state and uh, just look at this picture underneath where Xi Jinping is holding his elderly mother's hand and so he's playing the the dutiful filial son taking care of his elderly mother and it's really striking to me how much of the recent Communist Party propaganda is reminiscent of centuries old Confucian didactic texts that prescribe uh, the correct behavior, correct women womanly virtues. Um, and I have a quote here from a Qing Dynasty text about exemplary women. The last line there is, when every family is harmonious, the state is well governed. And that's a centuries old text, but what you see today in the People's Daily and Xinhua News, and a lot of that propaganda is so strikingly similar to those Confucian notions that as long as the families are all harmonious, the, the women are dutiful and subservient, then the nation will be stable. Um, here are some more images of um, the manly personality cult surrounding Xi Jinping. And a lot of people have written about the, the uh, unprecedented, uh, well, we haven't seen this kind of personality cult since the Mao Zedong era. Um, but it's very much a hyper masculine personality cult where, uh, for example, this hip-hop song about Xi Da Da, as he was known for quite a long time until um, until uh, propaganda de department decided maybe that was going a little overboard. Um, but this song was, if you want to marry, marry someone like Xi Da Da. And, and, um, and so he's presented not just as the ideal father, but also the ideal husband, very manly. And also this first speech that Xi Jinping gave as General Secretary of the Communist Party in January of 2013, where he talked at, at length about the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union. And this is something that obsesses the Communist Party. How do we avoid that fate? Um, and he said the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. And so a lot of what we see since then in recent years is is showing Xi Jinping as the manly man who can stand up to all of these threats from the outside that are from so-called hostile foreign forces like the US or the UK, particularly the US, trying to undermine China's standing in the world. Um, and that Xi Jinping is the man who is strong enough to defend and protect the Communist Party and uh, and the Chinese nation state. So um, in all of this propaganda, I'm going to skip over this part, in all of the propaganda that we see, um, there is almost no mention ever of the importance of working women to China's economic growth, to promoting women. Um, it's all about promoting a traditional wifely, womanly virtues. Um, and that coincides with the drastic change in China's population planning policy. So they abolished the so-called one-child policy at the end of 2015, and at that very moment, they started pushing an aggressive propaganda campaign, getting uh, particularly educated Han Chinese women to have babies. And they had to get married first. So um, so first of all, the Communist Youth League has been since last year strongly pushing uh, mass matchmaking festivals. Um, but I just want to show you some examples. This is a People's Daily article um, around the time that the government announced it was ending the one-child policy. And the headline is, Female University with Students Have Brighter Job Prospects. Student Moms on the Rise. 
And if you look at this very striking uh, photograph that they use, it's very reminiscent of Margaret Atwood's dystopian novel, A Handmaid's Tale, which describes a country with plummeting fertility rates and young fertile women are forced into having sex and having babies. And, and it's quite haunting how um, similar the situation is becoming in China where birth rates are dropping. And so even though now the Chinese government has implemented an official so-called two-child policy, last year the birth rates still fell. And so this is something that is very alarming to the Chinese government. Um, the birth rates are falling, marriage rates are falling, the population is severely aging, and the workforce is shrinking. And so all of that affects China's future economic growth. And so as probably everybody here is well aware, economic growth is slowing in China. Um, and so for decades with the so-called economic miracle, the Chinese government was able to co-opt the population by promising them constantly rising living standards. But that era is now over. And so you have the emergence of a much more authoritarian China, um, we had the abolition of presidential term limits earlier this year. Um, and so the propaganda, uh, it, it's the, the, the Communist Party sees the answer in large part as trying to get women, educated women, to, um, to marry, first of all, because that's conducive to, to political stability, and then to have babies. So with this picture, um, you know, the focus is all on the baby, the mother. What is also notable is that she has a mortarboard on her head. She's educated. So just here's another example from People's Daily. Last year, the headline was, you'd better believe it, under 30 are women's best years for getting pregnant. Um, and this is, article was all about urging female college students to have babies. And uh, the subheading was, female university students' joyful love. Freshman year, live together. Sophomore year, get pregnant. Junior year, have baby. And the picture is of these very attractive young college graduates all huddled around the baby carriage because that is, of course, every woman's dream is to have this little baby. Um, and then the on the right, the graduate there is not only is she cuddling her toddler, but she's also um, has her hand rested on a very visibly pregnant belly with her second child. Um, and so this is the kind of propaganda that we see after over 35 years of propaganda telling women, uh, not just propaganda, but very coercive measures, you know, uh, forced abortions or mass insertion of IUDs. Now they've done a 180 degree turn. They're trying to really push these women into having babies. It is not working. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but I want to contrast. Uh, uh, it's not just about getting Chinese people everywhere to have more babies because it's very much what kind of population does the Chinese government want to sculpt? So if you look at what's happening in Xinjiang, of course we have tons of news recently about the mass internment of Uyghur Muslims. Um, but long before that even really began, um, population planning officials in Xinjiang were already warning about, quote, worryingly high birth rates and rapid population growth in Xinjiang well, I mean, that's the complete opposite of what they're saying about the rest of China. So in Xinjiang, uh, this was in 2015, an official said that the high birth rates in Xinjiang, quote, negatively affects population quality in the region, posing risks to social stability. So... Um, so when we think about the future, what is China's uh, government going to do next? The two-child policy has failed to produce this bump in birth rates that was, was hoped for 
what is going to happen next? Well, I, I don't believe that the government is just going to suddenly announce complete reproductive freedom for all women living in China. Fundamentally, it's about controlling women's bodies, getting women to uh, have babies when desired. Educated Han Chinese women have to have the babies in Xinjiang and other uh, it's even spreading to other ethnic minorities, not just Uyghurs. Uh, those women are seen as undesirable and, and the government does not want them to have as many babies. Um, so whatever policy ends up coming up next, it's all going to be continuing control of women. Now, um, I want to get to the question, so where does feminism come in? Well, first of all, the feminist movement is highly organized. These activists are really effective. They know how to mobilize other women across localities. Um, they, they're very clever in their use of social media. They're able to amazingly get around the drastic internet censorship, which has increased a lot in the last few years. There, I, I detail a lot of the personal persecution of individual feminist activists. Um, but it's, it's not just the political organizational ability of these feminists. It's also the fundamental message of feminism. That is perceived as a threat. Because the fundamental message is women should be free to do whatever they want with their lives and with their bodies. And so if women don't want to get married, they shouldn't have to marry. And if they don't want to have children, they shouldn't have to have babies. But in, in the view of the male-dominated Communist Party, that is going to lead to chaos. So, um, so the message of feminism itself, not only is it inherently a threat to the Communist Party's goal of pushing traditional gender norms, of trying to get women to marry and have babies early, or Han Chinese women, um, it's also that... Uh, this was incredibly popular. I mean, there are so many young women all across China who just love this message because they're, they're so sick of being pushed into getting married when they're not ready. They want to advance their careers. They may want to further their educations. Maybe they want to leave China, study abroad for a while. You know, they don't want to marry some random guy off the street they don't like um, and spend the rest of their lives, you know, beholden to that man's family. And so increasingly women, not only do they not want two children, they increasingly don't even want one child. Um, so all of this combined, the incredible popularity of that message, that resonates literally with tens of millions of young women all across the country. Um, and so most recently we've seen Me Too taking off in China and that's just incredible that uh, a hashtag movement like that can gain traction in the face of all these, in, all, all these enormous obstacles obstacles, heavy internet censorship, no press freedom, so you don't have news media investigating, you know, sexual violence, they're, they're all being censored, uh, you don't have an independent judiciary, so victims of sexual violence don't have any recourse, in spite of all of these enormous vehicles, uh, uh, sorry, the obstacles, we continue to see brave young women coming forward just because they want to tell their story. Um, and lastly, just before I open it up to questions, another element of the feminist movement is its overlap with the labor rights movement. So we're not just talking about the urban elite women, um, you know, trying to spread the message of feminism. It's also permeating into the working classes. And most recently, the, uh, the, the most prominent Me Too activist was a senior at Peking University which is China's top university. Her name is Yue Xin. Um, and 
she was persecuted for her Me Too activism, but then after she graduated, she went south and tried to organize, uh, unionize workers at a factory in Shenzhen, and now she's missing, presum presumably detained. So there's this cross-class element that is extremely revolutionary when you consider the entire history of China's revolutions. So um, I'm all open it up to questions there. Thank you. Hi, we have time for some questions. Um, if you're asking a question, could you please identify yourself and uh, what organization you're with? So do we have a few? Um, yeah, over here. I'm Bob Meyer with PharmaLink International. I attended your speech and I read your book on leftover women, which I found fascinating and commend you for it. Uh, Zach Dickwald also spoke here. I don't know if you're, he's actually a Columbia grad. And one of the points he makes in his book is that couples need to have, if you want to get married, you have to have an apartment. Someone's got to own an apartment, and the families pull together to get the money, and you made the point that women often have to give up their cash to support a, co a male cousin. It would seem to me that uh, getting married as a student in college is too young from a Western point of view, but putting that aside, there's no apartment. I mean, you don't even have time to get a job. You don't have a job yet or to have an apartment. And if I, I wonder whether the Communist Party has focused on this point because property and apartment seems to be the principal uh, unit of wealth holding in China yeah. by the population uh, in order to progress the ideals that they have. Right. I mean, uh, well, the thing is that this propaganda is really failing. It's, it, the young people just don't buy it. It's so on the face of it, absolutely ridiculous. So, um, and yet they still keep coming out with it. I, I really believe that the propaganda is largely aimed at the older generation. And so the older generation is much more susceptible to these rather ridiculous messages. And um, so the primary pressure on young women to marry comes from their parents or other elders in their family. Um, and those older people, older Chinese people, are more susceptible to propaganda. Um, and so then they, they maybe they're watching TV and they see some, you know, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, I emphasize uh, articles in People's Daily and Xinhua News, but there are also a lot of TV programs that push these really traditional gender norms, um, just the popular culture that's spread as well. Um, all sorts of activities like uh, the mass matchmaking that you see, various forms of mass matchmaking largely directed at educated um, Chinese. But they, uh, it, the government itself, and I wrote about this a lot in my first book actually, about how um, the pressure to buy a home was also combined with the pressure to marry. Um, and uh, But I haven't seen so much propaganda lately about the home buying. It's I think the government's focus now is really on the babies. Um, that's their primary concern. And, and yet they they insist that uh, the women or women and men have to be married before having babies. It's not just about the babies because if it were, then they would allow single women to have as many babies as they wanted. But in fact, um, it's all about controlling the population. So single women face enormous barriers if they want to have a baby, and it's possible. Um, but largely, it's wealthy single women who have the means to pay um, all sorts of fees that are imposed on them. There are some very wealthy single women who maybe go abroad to freeze their eggs, because there are a lot of restrictions on uh, assisted reproductive technology if you're not married um, and this is where marriage is also a really critical component of the political stability um, that it's marriage combined with child rearing um, 
but the home buying element is not so much a big feature of the propaganda now, but, but it's already been long established that it's, you know, it's this norm that you, you're supposed to buy a home when you get married. Um, but the thing is, of course, these homes are so expensive that young people can't afford to buy them on their own. And they, they have to rely on their elders um, to help subsidize the purchase of the home. And then women get shut out of that property wealth. Other questions? No, Florence. Thank you, Florence de Changer, reporter with Le Monde and um, French National Radio. Um, first, um, I was just wondering what, what you described initially um, with this educated hen woman push to um, have babies is reminiscent to me of what has happened in Singapore. Uh, and I was wondering if there is also um, eugenism, basically, there, if it's really what they're uh, trying to do. And um, I'd like to hear your comment as well on, on, the, one, on the effect of the one-child policy, because uh, it was said that for a while, this one-child policy actually helped women uh, get to back to work uh, in important, uh, important roles, including in politics and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that. And it is true that if you have to deal with only one child as, as a mother, you're, quickly, uh, you're more quickly done than in, if you have to deal with six or, or yeah. more. Um, and and, and uh, another point that I find fascinating is your take on the internet love forums which are widespread in, uh, in China and how do they play in this feminist awakening? Is it something that feminists uh, like or the other way around? Because it's, a, it's almost a market, it's making market of love but it works in both, si in both ways. Are you talking about the internet matchmaking? Yes. Is that what, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, um, Eugenics is very much a, it's, it is long for decades, been an integral part of China's population planning policy. And in fact, they used to explicitly have a regulation with the word eugenics in it, and then they changed the name a few decades ago to something like maternal and infant health regulation. Um, so there's widespread, you know, screening for birth defects um, because they want to avoid having babies with any kind of defect. Um, but the eugenics element definitely comes into play when you see the different policies being carried out uh, in Xinjiang, for example, where they're clearly trying to dilute the Uyghur population to reduce birth rates there. And, you know, recently heard about children being taken away from Uyghur parents and mothers and, you know, being placed in Han Chinese families. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the mass matchmaking and the pro-natalist policies are targeting primarily educated Han Chinese women who are considered to be high quality. So eugenics is a very big part of this. Um, yeah, with regard to the one-child policy, there's been a lot of research um, showing that the one-child policy did result in uh, parents investing more if their only child was a girl. Investing more in the girl's education because she doesn't have to compete with a brother for parental investment. Although actually um, in the research that I did for my first book I, I also uh, question, I think there are real limitations to that thought because I found so many examples of even, even uh, families with only one daughter it would, they would, the parents would invest a lot in the daughter's education, but when it came to home buying, <laughs> So many of these parents wouldn't want to contribute to their only daughter's purchase of a home that they would rather direct their money towards another male relative, like a male, a, a nephew, for example. Um, and obviously there are exceptions to that. But, uh, but when it came to home buying, I still found that the flow of assets towards the purchase of home flowed towards men. Um, so there is a real limitation to the 
belief that the one-child policy empowers women. I, I just think it's very limited, actually. Um, and with regard to internet, there's, I mean, there are so many matchmaking websites and, and uh, a lot of these matchmaking websites uh, that conduct surveys that are totally biased. Um, you'll find a lot of the matchmaking surveys online are actually uh, conducted by real estate agencies combined with matchmaking agencies. So how convenient. <laughs> you know, once you find your match, you can buy a home as well. Um, so, uh, but the thing is that there is so much out there. It's not just overt government orchestrated propaganda and policies. Um, that kind of sexism just permeates Chinese society. Um, and it's in response to this growing gender inequality, of many forms of gender inequality, um, the growing gender wealth gap, the falling female labor force participation, which continues to fall by the year, uh, according to the World Bank, um, rising uh, the rising gender income gap, um, increasing gender discrimination in employment, where in fact, you know, some people here like uh, Li Yuan has written about, you know, companies that say explicitly, we're not going to hire women, no matter how qualified the women are and even though that is actually technically illegal but it's just common practice and so on top of that on top of all these companies stating explicitly that they will not consider women as applicants on top of that you see new forms of gender discrimination with the onset of the official two-child policy where when women apply for jobs they're routinely asked are you married when are are you going to have your first baby? When are you going to have your second baby? And that makes employers very, very reluctant to hire women because the burden is still on the employer to provide maternity leave. So a lot of this is about privatizing uh, welfare. And, and the government doesn't want to assume the burden of childcare, so it's not in implementing. I mean, in the early communist era, they used to have these communal nurses nurseries, child care centers. Well, they don't have them anymore. So you have to be wealthy to afford to put your child in a child care center. Um, and then, you know, uh, they're privatizing elder care as well. So this will save the government a lot of money. Um, and one of the uh, feminist activists I interview, who was the founding editor of uh, New Qian Zhisheng Feminist Voices, which, by the way, was also banned earlier this year um, because it was becoming too successful. So they banned the most influential feminist website and social media account. But she says that China's economic model, economic development, is based on the exploitation of women, um, the privatization of all of these forms of labor, um, caretaking of, the, of children, caretaking of the elderly. And, and that's also a big part of, so there's the economic role um, that the, the government sees is important. There, then there's the role in ensuring political stability and avoiding chaos. Um, and one of the things that I argue as well is that the more women are unencumbered by family ties, so single women in particular, single child-free women, um, are much more able to disrupt the authoritarian order. And the more that you are tied down by family, if you have a spouse or you have children or you have you know, other family members, those family members are all part of the whole social um, stability maintenance apparatus. So, for example, when the Feminist Five were detained and then they were released, their family members were all told, you have to make sure your daughter does not get into trouble again. It's your responsibility responsibility or we're going to punish you. And in fact, some of the, the detained feminist activists, their parents were held under house arrest as well. And this is a very, very effective form of controlling perceived troublemakers. We have time for one more question in the back. 
Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Biederman and I'm with the Public Interest Law Network in Hong Kong. Um, I had a question about uh, supply and demand um, and with the significant gender imbalance that has emerged from the one child policy, uh, one would think women would have a lot more power to set the rules um, and that obviously has not been the case. Um, so even if the marriage rate were not declining, you would still have quite a, a, a number of males without uh, opportunities for a spouse in the population. So I'm wondering your thoughts about why official policy hasn't been more uh, cognizant of this potential power that women have to set the rules and why it hasn't been more um, receptive to sweetening the deal for women. Yeah, well, I mean, there, are, there have been quite a lot of economists who argue that a scarcity of women should mean that women hold more power, but those economists just don't, they're not looking at real life. <laughs> they come up with their formulas and, and they have nothing to do with the real world. Um, so we're talking about society here where there is deeply entrenched misogyny and sexism. Women in China, as in many other countries in the world, do not have power. And the propaganda often is that, oh, these greedy women, with you know, they can command such a high bride price, for example. It's so expensive to marry a woman. You can only marry a woman if you own a home, a fancy home, because Chinese women are so greedy. Well, you know, that is just, after all the research that I've done, that's really a myth. Um, and uh, and why is it that the propaganda, you know, doesn't try to pressure men into marrying? It's focusing on women and blaming women, you know, for having too high standards in getting married. Well, the fact is, it's the women who don't want to marry. I mean, men, by and large, want some woman so that, you know, he can be taken care of. Um, but I, I get very disappointed by a lot of the news coverage that talks about, oh, these poor men, they can't find a wife to wash his clothes. And I just, but, but, but when you look at the actual data, who possesses the wealth, for example, when you're talking about property, the vast majority of residential property belongs to men. Um, and then there's been a rise in the traffic king of women from other countries. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it just is emblematic of the, of the fact that the subjugation of women, keeping women down, is integral to authoritarian control. And this also extends beyond, it's not just about China's economic growth either. Because it w if it were simply that the Communist Party wanted to keep up rapid levels of economic growth, well then it would only stand to reason that they would want to encourage more women to succeed in the workforce and to advance so that they c women can contribute to China's economic growth further, but they're not doing that, which which tells you fundamentally it's about political survival. That these, these are men who see that their rule is under threat. It's under threat from all different sides, from the rest of the world, inside China. Their primary goal is to stay in power. So how do they stay in power? If, they're, if you know, the price is slowing economic growth, um, I mean, there are so many things they could do to stimulate economic growth, but their answer is to push women to return to the home and have more babies. Um, I mean, that's about ensuring stability, political stability. That's that's been uh, th that's seen as a critical part of the answer, but I don't think it's going to be successful. And this is what what I think over the next few years we're going to see this incredible confrontation we already see playing out now 
the Chinese government's trying to push women, just suppress them all, uh, push them into marrying and having babies and give up their dreams of whatever, uh, being ambitious in their careers. But young women in China increasingly are not having that. They're saying no. And that confrontation is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Thank you.